Hi. Welcome to the Waterbury Public Library. Uh, my name is Rachel Muse. For those who don't know me, I'm the library's director. I'm so happy you're here to join us for tonight's event, which I'm really looking forward to. Tonight's program is part of a series of events we've been hosting at the library, thanks to the American Library Association's Libraries Transforming Communities Grant. Um, this grant is uh, an effort to spark discussions in our community between diverse groups of people to better understand our differences and to find some common ground. Our first event last week was a book discussion of the book The Other Americans by Leila Lolami, and we'll be capping off the series with a panel discussion next week from the Central Vermont Refugee Network to hear from some new Americans in our community who have come to Vermont as refugees and asylum seekers. But tonight's program is called The Value of Our Stories, and it's brought to us by the Vermont Humanities Council. Our guest tonight is Rajni Ed Eddins. He's originally from Seattle and has been writing and performing poetry for a diverse audience for over 20 years, if I understand correctly, in Vermont for about 10 of those years. He's the author of two books of poetry, and his pre presentation tonight utilizes spoken word as a tool for engagement in conversations about race, culture, equity, and the richness to be found in each of our stories. Please join me in welcoming Rajini to Waterbury. Good evening. good evening. It's good to be here with all of you. Thank you for the introduction, Rachel. Um, as was spoken, I am a poet. I have been writing and sharing my art probably for close to 30 years now. My mother was the founder of the first black writers group in the Northwest in Seattle, Washington, um, known as the African American Writers Alliance. So I started performing with them as the youngest member at that age. So I've always been immersed in that culture of storytelling and uh, sharing of poetry and artistic expression and creativity. Uh, my mother would often have me read her pieces back to her with feeling <laughs> to make sure that um, we breathe life into, into the stories. So that gave me a lot of love and appreciation for what you could do with words and how just with the intonation um, and the nuance of how you speak and engage with people, you can take people on journeys um, maybe that they had not even or seen themselves. Um, so I've been here in Vermont now for about 12 years. Um, it'll be 12 in March. My background is in using spoken word as a tool to empower youth and community, um, to hold space for conversations on the social construct of race, um, affirmation of people's uh, identity and shared humanity. So I, I'll be about well, a little over two and a half years ago. I decided to compile about a 22 plus year span of my text to make a transition into full-time employment and sharing my artistry. Um, living in Vermont has been a challenging experience in some regards, dealing with uh, microaggressions and just racism and, and the constant need to teach people, uh, you know, for, for, in a space that's pretty homogenous and doesn't have a lot of access to the, the greater diverse array of the human family. Um, so some of these pieces come from these experiences I've experienced here. Some are from when I was back um, home in Washington where I grew up as a child. So I'll be sharing a number of pieces from this text and uh, just giving you a brief background of, about each piece. And I want to hold space at the end of the sharing for if there's any questions or things that pique your interest or that struck a chord with you or uh, you have a, um, some, some interest in learning more about what the background was, definitely feel free to engage, because I, I share for that purpose. I love to engage and share my work, and it's more so for the response, for the holding a space for people to let it resonate and see what it means to you personally too, and how that can be a way of us learning and growing together. So the first poem I want to share with you this evening is called Middle Passage. This is a poem that I wrote probably when I was about mm, 17 years old. Um, I had a long, for quite some time wanted to write something to speak to the experiences of my African ancestors who were enslaved here, um, and whose labor was uh, the impetus for the industrial revolution of this country, and who have still yet to be fully recognized as, for their humanity and for their vital sacrifice. Uh, but it just seemed as a child it was something that was too big. Have you ever felt like that? That's something you want to 
express, but like, am I the one to do it? Like, how will I, will I mess it up, you know, or will I not do it justice? So I was asked by a friend of mine at that time if I wanted to come and perform a piece for this event called the Ma'afa. Uh, Ma'afa means um, great tragedy or great calamity, and it's the time when people of African descent come together to remember and honor the ancestors who went through this, um, this great travail and tragedy and still persevered and honored their resiliency in our own. Um, so I felt like that was permission, like that was an opportunity to say, okay, well, I'm being asked to do it now, so I guess <laughs> I have to go ahead. So that's kind of how this piece comes about. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to rub your hands together like this. So my mother taught me that she learned from an indigenous elder. You rub your hands together like this and you feel the warmth, send the energy my way. This is how you give an artist or someone who's sharing with you, sending that, that love and that positive energy. So I always reciprocate. Middle passage. There should be oceans of tears. There should be oceans of tears. This ink is not my blood. What right have I to speak? What right have I to speak? Think my words the salty oblivion to swallow this globe. Submerging continents. Mother's one perfect tear for her children. There were children in that small cramped space giving birth in fetal position to stillborn cosmos, tiny infants with mayhem as midwife. Below deck, below death, below breath was hope hidden in heartbeat rhythm. And now sometimes I see our children are below deck, crammed in into small cramped space, but the wooden planks are blocks and stoops and streets. But our heart beating hope tells me you don't have to live that metaphor. For we are the lineage of stars and suns. Look at the sky and see your reflection. Forgetfulness would have us think the oceans dreamt them. But galaxies do litter the sea floor. No one can ever take away our before. They sunk so that we saw. They hung so that we saw. They sunk and sung with tears in their lungs so that we saw. This is not a metaphor. This is not a metaphor. This ain't no metaphor. Middle passage. Thank you. I think it's always important to start with that um, piece in particular because it's vital that we honor those who came before us, whose shoulders we stand upon, who we would not be here without. So I always want to make that gesture um, in reverence whenever I begin because I see myself as the extension of my ancestors and my mother in particular really imbued that and to me with her upbringing. So Don, thank you for listening. The next piece I wanna share with you is called Blackness. Uh, this is a poem that was written not too long, so that middle passage was 17, middle, uh, Blackness was 18, and I just uh, graduated from high school and began up working at a school called TT Minor Elementary School. The majority of my life I've been engaged working with youth from elementary to academia. I should mention my mother was, was a foster parent over 70 children, so I was always the older brother. So that combination of being immersed in a community of self-expression and artists, storytellers, playwrights, uh, musicians, and being the youngest, and then in my own household being like kind of like the second in command, the oldest boy, my mother's only birth child, and having so many brothers and sisters whose stories you would never fully know, never knowing what past trauma they came from. Um, that gave me a certain appreciation for the power of love and compassion in holding space for people's trauma, and that essentially all human beings need that sense of belonging and positive affirmation and kindness and tenderness consistently. Um, so I had probably something close to a doctorate by the time I graduated <laughs> from high school because I had so many brothers and sisters from in infant age to adolescent. Um, so when I first started working at TT Minor Elementary School, 
um, there was a, a black girl there who had a, a white doll and she told me that um, she thought her doll was prettier than her. Um, she didn't, she said that her hair was ugly, you know, she thought her hair and her skin was ugly. And I just remember really being just angry and frustrated because I, I knew by then about that historical doll test, you know, and different uh, attempts to impress upon black people in the world that our features were less than beautiful and that people of European descent were some type of ideal for human beings. And it so really stuck in my craw. I wanted to write something to speak to her experience and to speak to the experience of all black children who are subject to that and to speak to that common human experience of recognizing that every single one of us has something beautiful about us and we were made the way we were made because we're meant to be this beautiful. So this piece is called Blackness. So if you see some love, I'll share with you. Blackness. Who am I? When you see me, who do you see? Who am I? When you see me, what do you see? Misshapen perceptions of blackness. Dance, the speed of obsidian. Rhythmless oblivion. Mockingly grotesque. Malformed concept of a molasses mammy and her tall babies dancing gaily. Nooses strings sing the melody. Black breath can't scream when bodies swing. Days be just like minstrels, dancing the jig, that they feet so burned and white, blistering hot, that blood flow from their souls, like the birth nobody knows. It ain't minstrel, but it streams from such a purdy tune. Trip drops so sweetly white, it shame the moon. Now the sound be white, but the blood be black. Flow flood the mud to the desert smack. Its lips, black hips, and backs do sweat. Life stretched to give death with its breath. Trip, drop, breath, stop. Trip, drop. And you are not shit. You ain't hip hop, hip hop. The black blood blocks, splots to the spite being a blight. Water, snow white's desert appetite hatching this halo. Unholy spectrum of a sambo rainbow. Take a swig of my nigger swagger. Clay flesh blacker, blacker than sin, dark skin. It'll get you tipsy, topsy. Flip the corner up to be Rajney and you'll still down the well of my memory. Watching the ethos bubble in a frenzy. Eddie's echo. The evil villain with the heart of black emerged from the darkness. Heartless black, void, devoid, soiled, dirty, stupid, ugly. It was, it was, it was hip hop. This is bloody ground. You smell the coppery, cloying scent. Soiled black is my royal tint. Hip hop. I am a living urn. The ashes of my ancestors are my innards. Hip hop. When I am night and I hold the stars, I thank you for this black flesh that surrounds my being. Nappy child, self-exiled, treasure the flesh that you're blessed in. When I am night and I hold the stars, I thank you for this black flesh that surrounds my being. Nappy child, self-exiled, treasure the flesh that you're blessed in. Your words are so powerful in and of themselves, but I feel like your spoken word is probably even more so. Do you feel that way? Do you feel that people might not get all of it if they just read your poems? Well, I feel like that in general with poetry. I think yeah. that um, our voices give words life and deeper meanings and richer nuanced language and understandings and visual imagery than we'd be able to 
absorb or take in or visualize and be present with as it's resonating otherwise because there's so much music and language you know like you can probably all account for people in your family who have a certain phrase or a certain way they turn a phrase or say something colorful you're like oh I could I could read that off the page but when I hear it in this person's voice it resonates and it's a part of my story too so I feel like that that's a richer way of telling story. You can always read it for yourself and hear it in your head, but that, I feel like that's why human beings have kind of had that real age in memorial, the person who gathers the people and preserves the stories and, and, and regales people and takes them on journeys, uh, sensitizes the children's imagination and fires up that, that brilliant element because there's something so powerful in it, you know, that we have to draw from that potency. You know, that, with this particular piece, I think, um, it always touches a, a personal part of me because I, I was a child who was fortunate enough to always be affirmed in being who I was by a mother who was uh, intentionally pro-black in, in, a, in a manner speaking to our rich history as the foundation of all human civilization and recognizing that uh, that particular piece is glaringly missing in the education we're receiving um, and, and, and there's another slant that we have to protect ourselves from psychically, protect our children from psychically. So just seeing that those ones who have not been protected are uh, inoculated. Um, and the suffering that arises, you know, that when you convince a child to think ill of themselves. Um, that's why I want to use the musicality of my voice towards sensitizing people to that suffering and to how painful that is and to work in tandem as human beings, not as white or black people, but as human beings to appreciate the fullness of our stories as human beings from Africa to the present. So thank you for that question. Yes, sir. Can I follow up with that? I'm, I'm imagining you as an 18-year-old writing that. Do you, do you envision the way those words are going to come out, or are they they're just on page and then later you, you work through how they, they become expressed? Well, I, the way I write, my process is I, I'm, I'm writing, and I wait to hear the next line. Like, I think when I turned 11, so when I first started writing pieces, I really firmly believed that I was transcribing other people's stories. Like I was listening to ancestors and mm -hmm. other spiritual origins where I could write it and I'd wait to hear, and then what comes next? And this comes next, okay. So by the time I read it, wrote it, asked the question, <clears throat> transcribed, I would generally know the piece by heart. And I think a combination of see, seeing so many of my um, community um, elders share in, a, in various ways and the musicality of their language and the, the, the different variants in terms of how they express themselves and held presence in their own unique ways. And my mother priming me again with feeling to say things, say her, her words back to her and me kind of having that uh, resistance though, I have to read this again, but also like I wonder what the story is going to be because she's a really good writer. Um, I kind of unconsciously developed a palette of my own as far as expression. So when I started writing, I found out, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good at this, even though if I, if I couldn't really necessarily vocalize what I was doing at first, I already had kind of a knack for it. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I think I'll share um, maybe three or four more pieces because I want to make sure we have time to ask questions. Uh, this next piece I want to share with you is called uh, Why We Still Need Black History Month. And uh, this is a piece that was written, I'd say, maybe five years ago, maybe five or six years ago. I was working over at J.J. Flynn Elementary School. When I first moved here from Washington, the first school I worked at was Integrated Arts Academy. And I was promoted to move to um, J.J. Flynn as a, as a paraeducator, and I wound up working actually with my nephew, so it was totally kismet. And 
one of the librarians uh, who knew I was a poet and, and was curious about my, my thoughts on the, the month, um, just reached out to me and she said, no offense, but, and I was like, okay, where is this going to go? You <laughs> never know what that's going to be followed by. But she said, I, I, I said, okay, well, she's curious about something. I said, yeah, what, what do you, what's your question? And she said, um, well, how do you feel about Black History Month? Is it like, too short a month? Do you think it should be all year? Do you think it really sh shouldn't be a thing? I mean, kind of what's your, your feeling on it? So this is kind of how this piece developed. Peace and love. Awesome. Why we still need Black History Month. Don't be so fearful of being racist that it deludes your common sense. Are so fearful of racism existing, you become a hypocrite. I wrote this on the off chance there would be some black people who love themselves enough to listen in the audience. Are some white people who know black folk exist in more than convenient moments. Are just some human folk who love truth and have enough sense to care about their roots. The librarian asks me, why do you think we still need Black History Month? For the same reason that Texas calls slavery unpaid internship. Because the evil of ignorance and racism must be vigilantly opposed. With truth, love, and sincere inclusion. Because it was once Negro History Week. And for the children who daily see themselves through the lens of stereotypes. And those who only know television as relationship to black people and people of the global majority. For my daughters who are growing and will not be choked out by the diminishing of our value. For the legacy of our people that makes American ideals a sought for reality rather than a cliche banality. For you, for your spirit and your conscience so it doesn't putrefy in the delusion of denial and fear made religion. Because black people must not become history. Our story is a part of your story. The beauty, wonder, triumphs, and trials need to be known. Sung from the hilltops and mountain peaks, resounding in the valleys and grass plains, echoing down the alleyways and boulevards. Because black, red, brown, yellow are the colors of my true love's hair and the universe. Because beauty and truth will not be contained because these are our ancestors. We owe them a debt of gratitude because love will not be silenced because teaching white supremacy is poison. We are all still recovering, conditioned to tolerate it in small doses. The human family must heal. Soon this sickness will be vomited and all that will remain will be you. Beautiful, healthy, free-minded you. Think of it as your chance to celebrate the human family in preparation for making every day our celebration. Yeah, I think that's an important piece as well. You know, when I first learned about Black History Month, I had already had a lot of supplementing of my own education because my mother knew already what the lay of the land would be as far as how we were being taught about ourselves and kind of this white supremacist by default way of teaching that has kind of predominated in this country. Um, so just learning about the history of Dr. Carter G. Woodson who first started Black History Month when it was Negro History Week and the intention of all these different historical um, scholars and ancestors who work to expand the narrative to appreciate the fullness of black people's contributions 
what's the more I think of it, it's just a, a sane approach. You don't learn about trees by just studying one twig or <laughs> one branch or one leaf and say, that's the whole tree. It's like, no, you have to start with the roots of something, the seeds of something. So I'm definitely thankful for that learning. And I, and I always strive to impress things that are meaningful in my poetry that can hold, be held space for in, in dialogue with adult groups like this and also for youth to have the opportunity to engage them as they're developing is vital because there's so many elements they're inundated with that if they're not um, cultivated in terms of, of a, in a way that respects their intelligence and appreciates the fullness of their humanity and gives them a myriad of different experiences to draw from and it kind of just repeats the process of having people be socialized to behave the same way. So I think it's important to use art as a fulcrum for that outcome. So I think I'll share um, maybe two or three more pieces. This next piece is called um, Advice for Police. It's actually the, uh, the short-handed uh, title. Um, The full title is actually Advice for Police in De-Escalating Potentially Volatile Situations Without the Use of Deadly Force. All right, so send me some love. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> Thank you. Advice for Police in De-Escalating Potentially Volatile Situations Without the Use of Deadly Force. Pretend I'm white. Pretend white means human. Pretend white isn't silent and invisible. Pretend you aren't pretending. Pretend I live in your neighborhood. Pretend I'm your mother's bridge partner, your father's hunting buddy, the paper boy from across the street. Pretend when you see me, you don't see an animal. Pretend you don't believe I'm dangerous. Pretend your jaw isn't clenched, that your hands aren't sweating. Pretend we are human beings. Pretend you care about me. Pretend I'm white. Pretend I just shot up a church full of black people. Take me to Burger King. Pretend it's my way right away. Pretend I'm white. Pretend you would not put a knee on a child's back. Pretend your silence isn't a knee on my back. Pretend you weren't trained to see my skin as a threat. Pretend all lives matter to you, that you don't see my life as the color of my skin. Pretend it's not a full-time job to lie to yourself. Pretend you're not pretending. Pretend you can use a taser before a gun. Pretend you can use your body before a taser. Pretend you can use your words before violence. If I talk back, pretend I'm white. If I cuss you out, pretend I'm white. If I threaten your life, pretend I'm white. If I cooperate, pretend I'm white. If I'm pregnant with three children, pretend I'm white. Pretend white is a euphemism for something like human, something like worthy of consideration, something like free. If I have mental health issues, pretend I'm white. Pretend white means I have mental health issues. Pretend your gun is like a mirror. Now turn the gun, I mean mirror, toward yourself. Pretend your gun is not a mirror. Pretend you are not afraid to face the mirror. Pretend you know we are all reflections. Pretend Tamir Rice was a grown man. Pretend you know both Jordans. Pretend Sandra Bland is still alive. Pretend white fragility doesn't cost people their lives. Pretend you are more human than skin, more spirit than badge. Pretend I am your child. Pretend you want us to live. actually do um, two or three more now, and then we can hold space for a conversation, because I think we have it till about 7.30. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so again, if there's anything that speaks to you personally or that stands out, you have a question about, definitely feel free to ask at that period or even in between. Um, this next piece is called Charlena Lyles. Um, Charlena Lyles was um, a woman who was killed in Seattle, Washington. Um, she was pregnant at the time and with her children. She was known to have a history of mental health um, uh, difficulties and she was actually the one who initiated the call to the police and that call um, ultimately resulted in her death where she was shot by the police. And she's not that larger woman, maybe about five feet, pretty petite. Um, but then again, it's not, to me, when I look at these things, I, I see so much history in present day of the justification of the killing of black people. You know, about a hundred or so years ago, you didn't even necessarily have to have an excuse. Um, or you could use whatever excuse at the time was convenient to use. Now, because we're seemingly more civilized um, and so-called post-racial, these are all supposed to be isolated incidents. But I think it speak, the litany speaks to how we're socialized collectively um, to perceive black people, no matter the age or identity, uh, as monsters to associate blackness with that to be feared and to, you know, with the, with the, with the birth of a nation, this, this, these films that justify the stereotypes held by um, many people of European descent to justify the mistreatment of black people. It's, it's that cognitive dissonance. So this is kind of where this piece arrives at. It's called, Charlene Lyles and her daughters will turn into wolves. Thank you. Charlene Lyles and her daughters will turn into wolves. The moon will howl back and the sun will be your undoing. Emmett Till will come back as Elephant Man. He will whistle lasciviously at white women in broad daylight and no harm will come to him. Sandra Bland will stand around your bed staring hungrily. Her gaze will change your heart to stone, or if already stone, then the rest of you. Jordan Davis will return. You will meet him in the gas station parking lot in your dreams. He will have just purchased cigarettes and a pack of gum. And oh yes, his music will be playing very loudly. Yes, it appears we are monsters. Demons with terrible resilience and incredible strength. We are coming for your children. No handcuffs, tasers, or futuristic weaponry will thwart your doom. We are rock and roll, R&B, hip hop, gyrating colorfully through your black and white TV screens. It's too late. Michael Jackson already made Thriller. The wretched Negro demon rapists are dancing with your daughters. We have already soiled the White House. It's brown now, like the earth our clawed hands clambered out of. We have the dark, dignified audacity to breathe the white man's air unapologetically. To look a white lady right in the eye, unfazed. To not stand for the hypocritical bullshit of white supremacy. Yes, the monsters are loose. We are claiming our lives matter more than just on Halloween. The next time you wear a Native American costume, you will be scalped and hung by the flag you hold so dear. The next time you wear black face, tap dancing in layers of burnt cork and grease to mock our monstrous plight, it will become permanent and none of your lily white loved ones will recognize you. You will be burned at the stake like only a true nigger or a faggot could be. You will taste the human tears, the blood behind these razor sharp teeth, and suddenly the world will morph and you will truly see the monsters at the dinner table, in your classroom, and right beside you as you lay down to sleep. Their red glowing eyes will surround you for knowing, for simply knowing that we are and have always been human.
I'll share two more with you. Um, this next piece is called Kappa Jo. This is written uh, during a class I was taking back in Washington called um, The African Continuum of Ritual Poetic Drama. And we used to go through these rituals where we would um, go to different places in our minds and our consciousness and then just kind of write stream of consciousness, whatever came out. And I wrote this piece at that time. I must have been, let's say, 19 or 20. And I read it and I said, I'm never saying that out loud. <laughs> but then I, I, I had a good bunch of friends. My, my mother and I co-founded a group called The Poetry Experience that we actually host here as well. And so we had a gathering at our home as we tended to do just to hold space for each other. And so I said, I'm going to share something with you guys now. Okay, I'm kind of sensitive about my stuff. Like, give me your, um, your, your opinion. What do you think? And they said, you should definitely share that. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a little encouragement for people to give you that, that boost to say. So you can spit it out. But I think that's the important thing about writing and expressing yourself and expressing hard truths and things that are going on in our heads. And because with that courageous vulnerability, uh, it grants other people the same permission to be honest about what their experience is and to learn from that vulnerable sharing of humanity in ways that can help to elevate us all and help us grow and hopefully outgrow a lot of troubling aspects. This is called Cup of Joe. America Sweet land of liberty Supersedes the natural rights Of my people to be free America Home of the brave Land where my people branded Labeled to be slaves America Can you spare some change? Or can you even spare the truth to help us on our way? America. These people come from low-income housing, underprivileged and uneducated, in dysfunctional surroundings such as these. Many times their hygiene suffers. These niggas is dirty, downright vile and mean and stupid as a block of wood. Wood. I wish a peck of wood would come down my block. I'd pop him with a Glock for stopping where he should not have been and cut off his oxygen. Now, now, Mrs. Brown, please calm down. Let's not become irrational. Look at me when I'm talking to you. Let's not turn this into a race issue. White people, having grown up in white families, have experienced all forms of racial bias, prejudice, and inequality, qualifying them to address oppressed peoples with the utmost sensitive. Besides, they ain't fit to raise their own kids. Black people are whiners. Everybody knows Jews are the most persecuted people in history. All I need to do is apply cocoa butter to the young Negro scalp for about three or five hundred years or so, or until the naps lay straight and the culture abates and the ass open takes. Her hair is so fun. <laughs> Can I touch her hair? Wavy, curly, nappy, straight. Wavy, curly, nappy, straight. Wave, shut up now, tell me, do you really want to love me forever? Oh, oh, oh. Paula Abdul was fine as hell, man. Well, you just like her because she likes skinned. Well, we skinned that there nigga alive. That'll teach him to look at a white guy. The suspect is black. In his midlife to early living. If you see this man, please do not. Please do not. If you see this man, please do not hesitate to avoid or avert eye contact at all costs. Clutch your purse in our pocketbook and cross the street. We repeat, this man is armed with consciousness. Warning, he may appear as a poet. If alerted to the said existence of racism, white privilege, you may experience abrupt discomfort, insidiously interwoven with the said topic of discussion. Do not panic, however. You may very want to yell, or cry, or scream out. I say do it. Yell out as loud as you can. I'm a good white person! It doesn't exist. I don't see color. I see shapes and triangles and parallelograms. 
I watch BET. I'm not a racist. Then, when this vile culprit tries to put you up on game that due to the nature of racism, in and of itself being a system of racial subjugation against non-whites in every area, human relation, entertainment, education, labor, politics, law, religion, sex, war, 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 and economics, culminating in the mass dispossession and genocide of the indigenous natives who founded this nation. Using this definition as a basis, if you got white skin and whatnot, then you profit from the psychosocial construct, struck, struck, I struck a match in the dark, walked the block and the door was locked, and I ain't got no key. I ain't got no key, I can't constantly jangle the lock open to feel myself freely, free myself to feel. Every time I get close to a lock broke, I get white, washed, flooded with guilt. Then I stop jangling the lock. Then the whispers come. Be silent, quiet, rarely seen, never heard. You don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. Refrain, abstain from saying them words. Words like white, like black, except when followed by inharmony. Like racism. Genocide. Holocaust. Therefore remain acceptable in appearance and character and manner and demeanor. Everybody knows a well-mannered black man is named by white people as a Negro. As I said before, I can't find the space to breathe comfortably in my soul lately. I got too many people in my head. I got black and white in my head to contend with. And every time I sing my pain, I feel like I'm dancing. Like the rushing currents and streams running blood and tears got white folks shoes tapping like some snappy, snazzy elevator music. Hip tunes to cruise to, huh? Hip hop tunes to cruise to. Music to live by, music to die by, music to drive by. I see them bobbing their heads off beat, exchanging PC convo on the cosmos and indigenous peoples at large over lattes. Damn shame what happened to them colored folks. It's a damn fine cup of joe. I think I'll close with the title piece. This is a poem that I was co-writing with a friend of mine um, maybe about five or six years now. It was around the summer that um, Trayvon Martin's trial was going on, Zimmerman's trial was going on for the killing of Trayvon Martin, and uh, where he was acquitted for shooting this unarmed teenager on his way home because he felt that his hood made him seem threatening. And even and I think. I had wanted to write this with a friend because we saw the litany, and when we, she learned that news and shared it with me, she was despondent. She said, why even write anything? You know it's just gonna keep happening. Like, what can we even do about this? And I had to try to assure her and console her and say, no, like we have these gifts as artists, as creators, to be able to speak life into these things, to hold people accountable to a higher standard of humanity. And I got off the phone and I, wept in, and this is kind of the piece that came out of it. For Trayvon, Mike Brown, and the countless unnamed. Lynching is not dead. It's done in broad daylight, under the hot lights of media frenzy, for black blood, white guilt, white fear and white acquittal, where brown boys are still expendable. Michael Vick should have had Zimmerman's lawyer. Brown boys are worth less than black dogs. Trayvon should have been a brown lab. Maybe then we'd see more of a humane society's presence. If poems could march in the streets, overturn verdicts, bring corrupt police to justice, if they could bring a boy back his life and a mother back her son, a father back his boy, return bullets to a gun, unloose the lynch rope, and unravel the knots from choked throats, we would not be choking on tears. When do our lives become valuable in the eyes of the law? When does hate cease to be exonerated behind a badge and lighter skin? And God forbid you wear a hoodie in the rain while having black skin with Skittles in your pocket. You can taste the rainbow, but you can't taste freedom. You can taste your own blood, but you can't taste the rainbow. Diversity is white people's cold word for niggers. 
You can taste the rainbow, but not if you're too dark. The rainbow may come during the storm. If you're too dark on a block, in a hoodie, and the skittles fall from your pocket, you never taste the rainbow. Your killer has the right to stand his ground. He may shoot you in the heart, and America may relive it in sordid detail. She is only reliving her nightmare. She dreams nightmares often. Open caskets, ashes, weighted limbs, no coffins. Two. His name is Trayvon Martin. Say it. Trayvon Martin. Renee Davis. Renee Davis. Khalif Browder. Khalif Browder. Corey Jones. Corey Jones. Elijah McClain. Elijah McClain. Freddie Gray. Freddie Gray. Pamela Turner. Pamela Turner. Mercy Mack. Mercy Mack. Tony McDade. Tony McDade. Terrence Crutcher. Terrence Crutcher. Terrence Sterling. Terrence Sterling. Dion Kay. Dion Kay. Darren Seals. Darren Seals. DeAndre Joshua. DeAndre Joshua. Philando Castile. Philando Castile. Alton Sterling. Alton Sterling. Corin Gaines. Gaines. Oscar Grant. Oscar Grant. The Charleston Nine. Charleston Nine. Mackenzie Cochran. Mackenzie Cochran. Jordan Baker. Jordan Baker. Kamani Gray. Kamani Gray. Timothy Stanberry. Timothy Sean Bell. Sean Bell. Sandra Bland. Sandra Bland. Natasha McKenna. Shelly Frey, Frey. Giovanni McDade, McDade, Benzel Hampton, Benzel Hampton. Aaron, Campbell, Aaron Campbell, Rennell Lewis, Rennell Lewis Tyree, Woodson, Tyree Woodson, Victor White, Victor White Jonathan, Farrell, Jonathan Farrell, Eric Garner, Eric Garner John Crawford, Crawford Ezel Ford, Ford, Keith Vidal, Keith Vidal Michael, Brown, Michael Brown, Jordan Davis, Davis Kajim Powell, Powell, Tamir Rice, Tamir Rice Jason Harrison, Harrison Uzman Zongo, Kendra McDade, Kendra McDade, Chavez Carter, Chavez Carter Maria Godinez, Maria Godinez Yvette, Smith, Yvette Smith, Louis Rodriguez, Louis Rodriguez Matthew Paolo, Paolo Amadou Diallo, Diallo. His name, he has a name. His name is I Can't Breathe. His name is Emmett Till. His name, his name, his name. You must remember his name. James Bird Jr. James Bird Jr. He may whisper it in the wind, you may hear it in your skin. His name is guilty in his innocence. Freedom fighter, martyr, troublemaker. His name, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, he has a name. His name is Black Boy, Blacklisted, Black Bald. His name is Black Power, Black Babies in a Black Market for Green Cash. Stolen Life, Tied to a Tree, Burnt at the Stake. His name, Probable Cause, The Negro Problem, Chalk Outline. White man's fear, his name ear for a souvenir, his name black nigger boy. Fred Hampton, Huey P. Newton, Mega Evers, his name saves lives, mobilizes movements. His name is Watch for a Black Messiah, Bullet to the Heart, Boy in Jaws of Wolf, White Girl Called Rape, Whistle Too Free, Head Too High. His name look me in my eye, his name must die. Gangster, thug, menace, stereotype. His name is Rest Like Demon. His name is taken to the Iron Bridge on Main Street. His name, his name's legs are pulled until his neck cracks. Stabbed, hung, shot, burned, ravaged by relic hunters. His name is mistaken identity. It's Gospel Boys, the Skeek Experiments, David Walker, living, breathing black manhood, heathen, pagan, no salvation. His name is, you free nigga, now get over it. Kunta Kinte, stolen African, strange fruit, stranger in a strange land, in danger of deranged hands, enemy of the state, Genetic center, asphalt art, bloody memory, collateral damage, white man's burden. That happened so long ago. Chain gang, wave slave, chattel, on the rack, in the irons, on the run, wanted. His name is arthritic hands that felt more thistles than cotton. His name is put your hands up, spread them, stop or I'll shoot. His name is bang, 41 shots. Asada Shakur, Angela Davis, Breakfast Program, Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. His name is, his name is, he has a name. His name is beaten severely, urinated on, chained by the ankles. His name is dragged for three miles and decapitated. Anyone places to have the remains. His name is missing an arm. His name is Crackhead, war on drugs, war on poverty, scapegoat, sacrificial lamb. His name is kicked carcass, convict, criminal, thief. Drug dealer, victim, still a child whose name will never breathe again. His name has a mother. His name is expendable. Sundown laws, Jim Crow cars, Jim Crow bars. His name is racial profiling. In court, just call him profiling, because this is not about race. 
His name is Marcus Garvey, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells. No rights a white man is bound to respect. His name has a title when he dies. His name is Mr. Mark. Wearer of the black hoodie, walker of the home path, wrong place, wrong time, wrong skin, wrong crime. His name is holder of the Skittles. His name, her mother, his mother knows his name. Her tears spell it in big bold letters down her cheeks. His name is gone too soon. His name is Darky, Spook, Jigaboo, Sambo. His name is different. Too difficult to be pronounced by thin lips with forked tongues. His name dies without justice. Missing. Lost. Bottom of the ocean. Shark food. Triangle trade of littered bones. His name is Sunchild, Star Fruit, young, gifted, and black, but you can call him nigger. His name, he has a name. His name is the sun is rising. His name is Wake Up! I know his name because his name is mine. Thank you. space for whatever is resonating with you. Uh, I know I, sh I shared a lot of powerful, emotional, visceral expression with you tonight. So if there are things that you have questions about or that you, um, something that stuck out to you that you're curious about or it speaks to your story somehow, definitely feel welcome to engage or reach out. extremely powerful and you're reading as we've already discussed I think even more so and you've been writing for your whole life how has it evolved over time how has it changed I think over time I've kind of learned more about the world and, and gain more experiences personally to, to see, to broaden my lens and to, and to understand more when I'm learning from different writers of the past, what they were talking about, and kind of how it shows up in this world in, in different forms, to have more of a through line historically. Um, so I think that, I mean, for instance, that final piece is the title piece for Trayvon. I couldn't have written as a teenager because I had to live a lot of different experiences and learn a lot of history to put together mm -hmm. the understanding that, oh, this is a, you can't call this isolated if it's, there's never been a stopping point. Mm -hmm. So I think that's more what that piece speaks to. So I think, yeah, having more experiences personally with racism mm -hmm. and, and navigating this country as a person of African descent, mm -hmm. um, in spaces where people aren't necessarily taught to embrace the fullness of each other's humanity and knowing what that feels like up close and, and then learning that a part of it was utilizing my craft as a way to alchemize it mm -hmm. so I wouldn't internalize it and become sick or despondent or jaded. I could still find kind of a, 
way to Aikido, that energy, and put it to a, a place of prescient, vital expression that can be used as a teaching tool and also as a catharsis for myself and to hold up a mirror to people and to society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to go along with that, like I see how cathartic that can be to get these ideas on paper and to share them. When I'm thinking about life in Vermont and you know your encountering of, of microaggressions and, and flat out racism and how in that moment, how you process that, how you deal with that. I understand writing, but writing might, might not be in the moment. So I'm, I have a lot of writing questions for you, but for some reason hearing this content, I'm like, how do you deal with those, those moments where you encounter what we're talking about here? I'm going to have to deal with them as rationally as I'm able. I mean, that's why I use my art as a, as a way to express my frustration with these experiences and the fact that they still continue and, and that are, there are younger people than me who are experiencing them right now. And I think I also do it to light a fire under people to say, what are you going to do to transform it? Because if it's not just about me personally, how I process it, the, the, the impetus behind it is holding space for encouraging you all to think critically about how you can help transform that dynamic and that consciousness in intentional and forthright ways in a way that uh, speaks more to your agency around it. So definitely, it's always, it's never fun to experience. You're like, okay, I'm sure anybody can identify as a human being with what it feels like to be patronized or undermined or underestimated. But yeah, it's like that. And you, and you learn how to deal with it in the moment. And I use my art as the, as the way to like kind of take those things that I witness and put them into a place. Sometimes I, I choose to educate the person in the moment if it feels like a sincere opportunity. If I just see somebody who's just trying to get my gold or just pull my chain, I kind of have to gauge what's going on so I can protect myself and know what's meaningful. But fortunately, I put together my art in a way so now I can hold space intentionally. So that's the way, that's my agency. So I, I encourage and challenge you to think about what your way is too. Yes, ma'am. Um, it sounds like growing up, you obviously became very familiar mm -hmm. with your mom's art. Um, and I'm curious if there's elements of um, your uh, art or your, your process um, where you really feel you know, your mom's influence or, or presence. Definitely. I mean, I think in the, in the spirit of my own song and um, in the, being able to bring uh, playfulness with words to the fore, she's a master of that, master storyteller, like just fount of wisdom, just stream of consciousness off the, off the fly. So I think a lot of those elements that just those kind of fireside chats that mom would just like drop wisdom on me into the night. I was always listening, you know? That was one thing about me as a child. I was a very um, intentional listener and kind of sat focused to pay attention to what my elders had to share with me. So I think drawing that from her, I'm able to embody that and carry that legacy forth. Because that's why I always start by honoring her and the people who came before. Because so I, I know that I wouldn't be able to do what I do without that. that um, cultivation and that positive affirmation of recognizing my brilliance and speaking to me, understanding that I'm already intelligent. I think the way you speak to people, the way you speak to children, when you honor their intelligence and you don't patronize them, that, give, that's, that uh, says a great deal about how they should become the people they're growing into. So I was fortunate to have a mother who always saw me as brilliant, don't get no big head. The so, but the balance is there. <laughs> so. Can I ask it, what brought you to Vermont? Yeah, initially I came here for family. Um, my godmother was ill, and so we came over to kind of help hold space for her healing, and then kind of had to regroup and find our footing here. 
I began working in the schools um, and learned that there was a great deal here that my art could speak to. And then through a lot of different experiences that I had here, I learned that, oh, this is a necessary chapter here too because I had to learn how to be resilient and practice faith as a principle. I think you never know really the principles you hold until you're put in tight situations. You don't know if you truly hold the principles you hold until it calls upon you to act on them. <laughs> and I've been called upon <laughs> to act on them a lot here. And so I feel like that um, that's something that's uh, a vital part of my growth and development here as an artist and seeing how I can use this art as a way to serve youth and community and engage like here and hold space for touching people's hearts and minds and uh, souls, spirits in dynamic ways that challenge people to grow, expand their narrative and appreciate a fuller sense of their own and each other's humanity. To be courageous, vulnerable, courageously vulnerable yourselves and I think that all that comes from modeling and being in space where if you're being pushed to be silent and you still remain vocal, that exercises a certain muscle, especially when it's coming from a place of love and appreciation for humanity and holding a higher standard for all people that, can, that will benefit you know, youth who are here and yet unborn. So it becomes like a kind of holy aim, a holy crusade to humanize and sensitize people and use art as the means. So I'm, I'm glad I came here. Can you talk a little about the work that you've done with children, and in particular, have you written anything specifically for children? Yes, uh, I've always worked with youth since, as I said, my mother was a foster parent, um, so probably since age nine. I've had a host of different experiences, um, and then from 18 on, I, actually even my, in my late, late teens, I was called on to engage teachers on how to incorporate hip-hop and, and spoken word as a part of their curriculum to make it more engaging for, for enhancement of literacy purposes. And then as I got older, people knew me for my gift and my way of engaging youth and being a warm person in community and holding space for positive connection and exploration of creativity and imagination. So that's something that I've always done. It takes, wears a number of hats now, whether it's writing workshops or school assemblies or um, lectures or, or, or talks on my own experience, how I came to art. So it wears a number of different hats. Um, but I always enjoy holding space for youth. I actually have a children's book that I'm working on. I have a series that I'm kind of co-writing with my daughter. But the first release is going to be called A Love So Big. And it's about children um, and parents who can't see each other. Mm -hmm. And kind of the fact that that love never goes anywhere as long as you stay appreciative and know that it's not about if, it's about when. Thank you. Is, is your mom still in Washington State? No, we're here. I'm actually her essential person, so we live in Burlington, Vermont. Um, I'm thinking of you reciting your mom's poetry back to her as a young child. <laughs> um, I'm, I teach language arts to students, and I'm wondering if there's one bit of information um, from your mom that you hold on to to this day. Um, something that she shared with you about, you know, reciting and spoken word and something that you still remember from from those younger days. Definitely. I, I think she she kind of gave me the freedom to create and, and learn my way of delivering. And she also encouraged me, as I said, to even say in her own pieces, to say things with feeling. So I knew when I was writing, that was already a vital component. It's like, I can't come out here and just, the roses are red. <laughs> like I have to make sure that I speak language in, to it and give it a certain energy and emotion so that people feel what I'm talking about and they can receive it that way. So I think the way, and more, more than like even asking me to say things a certain way, I think just exploration of being playful with language. We would do that often. So it wasn't even like something she necessarily had to coach. It was like, oh, let's try this out. And not, now you have to say it in this accent. So it was just like developing that muscle of exploration, making it a create, creative and fun activity that you don't always have to know you're growing while you're doing it. It's just enjoyable. 
So I think having that freedom of expression to play with language really opened the doorway to me in vital ways that are still living. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.